had a colon means refer to these three neurotransmitters. I try to tell my students to remember the cat is in the den. Okay, just so it might help you out. And then you could remember S, serotonin, sleep, maybe. Okay, so the catecholamines, as you can see, look, it starts with dopamine here. And then all you have to do is add one um, oxygen-hydrogen bond right here, and you get the um, norepinephrine. But then this then norepinephrine turns into epinephrine by just one more bond right here. So basically, dopamine turns into the norepinephrine, which turns into epinephrine. And this tells us a lot about behavior. So dopamine, to me, is one of the coolest neurotransmitters. This is your molecule for pleasure. So when you feel pleasure, when you feel really good pleasure, like, wow, I feel great. This, this one's more the mood, like, I'm in a, a depressed mood or I'm in an okay mood. But this one is true pleasure, like when you... Um, have an orgasm, that would be the release of dopamine. When you, They believe that when you fall in love, that's the release of dopamine. And in fact, I ask my students as I say, okay class, when can you know the difference between love and lust? And they kind of mill around. We do, 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 do. And basically what we find is, is um, for the first seven months when you fall in love, then it, you almost become obsessed with the other person. A lot of people become obsessed just constantly thinking about the other person. You can't wait to see them, so on and so forth. And then after seven months, the obsessive compulsiveness, the, the activation of the caudate nucleus in the brain, it kind of subsides. And then um, your, your relationship becomes very positive, but a little bit more realis realistic. But then what happens at about the two-year mark is that's when, um, unless you have a strong friendship or a strong commitment, that you might turn to the person and say, you know, I, I, I don't really feel the same way about you that I used to. So maybe, you know, you've been seeing the other person through rose-colored glasses, they say, and then all of a sudden at around the two-year mark, the glasses come off and you start to see the person as they are. And um, you don't feel that high, that rush when you're around them. So basically what they think that is, is you develop a tolerance to that person releasing the dopamine for you. So when you fall in love, when you're, when you're with this person, it releases dopamine and you feel high, you feel giddy, you feel great. But then after about two years, th that particular stimulus no longer produces the dopamine. So um, then kind of what we call as love junkies is now you say, well, you don't make me feel the way you used to, so now you look for someone else and you want them to make you feel the way you used to, so now you find someone else and sure enough you feel that rush, you feel that giddiness again, but then after about two years that's going to subside too, which is fine. You can keep going from partner to partner for, you know, every two years, but if you're looking for stability and you're looking for, um, a long-term commitment, you have to be realistic and you have to know that the, that person probably isn't going to stimulate the dopamine forever unless, um, and that's why actually a, a relationship where there is some conflict and there is some, um, the person kind of pushes you to try new things or kind of questions you, kind of uh, makes you adapt to them, a lot of times can be more stimulating than someone that's kind of always there for us, there's no surprise, so on and so forth. Whenever we have surprise or novelty or something unexpected or there's risk involved, then kind of we release the dopamine. Um, so dopamine is also released in response to novelty, and that's why surprise and uh, mystery is uh, something that can give us a lot of pleasure. Another thing that dopamine is involved in is it's involved in uh, movement. So for example, Parkinson's disease is a disease uh, where I think a lot of you know that, I'm sorry that this is so messy, but here we should put movement right here. Okay, so this is for movement. Okay. So uh, Michael J. Fox has the Parkinson's disease. What happens with um, 
with that is your arms, and they start to shake, you get tremors, you can't control them, your legs could shake, your limbs, um, sometimes they become rigid so you can't move them. Um, and so that's a lack of dopamine. So there was this guy, and he had these terrible Parkinsonian symptoms, and uh, what he did was he went to see this doctor that was about 2,000 miles away from his house, and he wanted this new drug. There's, they actually have synthesized the L-DOPA makes more dopamine. And so the drug L-DOPA uh, is used to create more dopamine to combat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. If you saw that movie, um, it's an old movie now, but uh, with Awakenings, and it had Robin Williams in it, and they had given all these old people this drug, and it suddenly made them young, and they became more sexual, and they had more energy, and so on and so forth. That was um, the L-DOPA, actually, that they had had used. So this guy goes to see the doctor 2,000 miles away and says, I really need this drug that you're prescribing to everybody. It's called L-DOPA, and, and I, I, my Parkinsonian symptoms are so terrible. Would you please consider give me, giving me this drug? And so the doctor said, okay, well, you look like a good candidate for this drug, but um, I'm curious, why, why did you come so far? And the guy got really nervous, and he says, uh, um, well, uh, um, my sister, she, she lives here, and so I came to stay with my sister, and I heard you were an excellent doctor, and so I wanted to see if you would prescribe me this drug. So the doctor did prescribe the drug, and the man was hospitalized for, uh, you know, they were watching him under the influence of the new drug, because it was new at the time in the testing trials. So in most people, the drug would take, oh, sorry, about a week or so to kick in. And, um, but for him, within a couple of days, I mean, he started walking everywhere. I mean, his limbs became less rigid, and, you know, he just walked everywhere, and he was just out and doing this, and the nurses were like, well, you know, he must be really happy to capture his limbs back, so that's why he's walking so much. He's just all over the hall, so on and so forth. But then after a few more days, his walk became a march. And so now he was marching up and down the halls, just back and forth, back and forth. And the nurses, you know, kind of thinking, well, this is, this is kind of strange, okay. But then after a few more days on the drug, uh, his march became like, um, he started isolating himself in the room. He, he started acting kind of paranoid. He'd be peeking around the doors. He refused to eat any hospital meals. He wouldn't let the nurses touch anything that he had. And so the nurses kind of went to the doctor and said, you know, doctor, we, we have some concerns about this patient. You need to check in on him. You know, he was walking up and down the halls, and then the walk became a march, and then now he's isolated himself in the room, but he's like, won't allow any of us in, and he's showing all these symptoms. So the doctor goes to see him at the door, and he says, um, hello, yeah, can I come in and talk to you? And, and he barely opens the door just to crack and he says, Doctor, are you alone? And the doctor says, yes, I'm alone. Are any of those nurses with you? No, no, they're not with me. Okay, come in, come in, come in. So the doctor comes in and he's, and the guy's got all these pizza boxes stacked up and all these Pepsi bottles and then there's like all these shades over the windows and kind of like all this stuff on his room like a barricade and the doctor's like, well, this is kind of strange. And he says, what's going on? And the patient says, doctor, I have a plan to save the world. I can make this place a better place. And so the doctor listens to his whole scheme plan. And um, he's like, oh, okay. But then the doctor says, uh, what about all these pizza boxes and Pepsis? He goes, well, you know there's nurses out there. Those nurses, they're planning, to, they're trying to steal this plan from me, and they are plotting to kill me. They're going to assassinate me. That's why you have to be alone. I have to get out of here, doctor, because if they get to me, I'm going to be killed. Okay, so by me telling you this story, can any of you think of what symptoms that kind of shows? Okay, that's, that would be kind of a schizophrenic delusion. So unfortunately... Uh, dopamine, uh, low levels of dopamine can um, be related to Parkinson's disease, but high dopamine activity is related to schizophrenia.
So I'd like you to know that that low dopamine activity, low levels of dopamine is associated with Parkinson's disease, but high levels of dopamine activity is associated with schizophrenia. So unfortunately for this man, as he had tried the L-DOPA again and again with different doctors throughout the United States, and every time, by raising his levels of dopamine, he it would put him into the schizophrenic delusions. His brain was set up in, in the effect that, for whatever reason, the L-DOPA actually triggered the schizophrenic delusions. So each time he had to be taken off. But then his Parkinsonian symptoms would come back very hard, and of course he would hate those symptoms and want to try again if only we could find the right dose or the right setup. So it's kind of a tragic story.